Who Wants to Be a Millionaire is one of the most popular TV game shows in history, with various different versions shown all across the globe, but it originated on September the 4th, 1998 in the United Kingdom, with Chris Tarrant hosting for the following 16 years. The format is simple. A number of contestants first compete to answer a question, usually by ranking four options as quickly as possible to get a shot at the game, known as fastest finger first. And from there, you are only 15 questions away from winning one million pounds. After each five questions, you enter the safe zone, where you are guaranteed to walk away with a minimum of £1,000 or £32,000 respectively, if you were to give an incorrect answer. You also have three lifelines, where you can ask the audience, call a friend, or have two of the wrong answers removed to increase your chance of progressing through the show. Though there is also an option to play it safe, and walk away with the amount that you have earned without taking the risk. In the early days of 1999 to 2000, around 11 million people would tune in every single week. But by 2001, nobody was suspecting that three completely random people seemingly obsessed with the television show would attempt to scam their way to a million pounds in front of a live audience, several microphones and cameras, and on national television. On August the 6th, 1963, Charles Ingram was born in Shardlow in Derbyshire, the son of Royal Air Force Wing Commander John Ingram and his wife, theatre set designer Susan. Sadly, while he was young, Charles' parents divorced and he spent most of his childhood in boarding schools around Shropshire. He became a member of the Combined Cadet Force and managed to complete the Duke of Edinburgh Silver Award before going on to gain a Bachelor of Science in Civil Engineering at Kingston University. It was in 1987 when Ingram trained for the British Army at Sandhurst and was even commissioned as officer in the Royal Engineers. In November 1989, Charles met Diana when training to be a teacher at Barry College in Wales. They soon became engaged during his posting with the Royal Engineers in Germany and the couple would end up having three children together. There's no doubt about it, we're lenient on each other uh, to a huge degree. You know, we are each other's rock. By 1990, he was promoted to captain, and after five more years had passed, he was now a major. In 1999, Ingram was sent over to Banja Luka in Bosnia for six months on peacekeeping duties for the United Nations, and by August the following year, he graduated from Cranfield University with a master's degree in corporate management. But away from the army and military life, Ingram and his family seemed to have a huge obsession with television game shows. Not only were he and his wife Diana fascinated by Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, studying general trivia books and watching the show extensively, but on December the 23rd, 2000, Diana's brother Adrian, after four attempts, finally made his way into the hot seat. And it's worth mentioning that this was after he had actually been previously arrested for credit card fraud. This is Adrian Pollock, a computer consultant from the Vale of Glamorgan up there in the audience, his brother Marcus. Now, you might recognise Adrian. I don't know what the odds are against this. They must actually be astronomical, but it is his fourth time on the show since September 1998, but it's the first time he's ever finally managed to get in the hot seat. And would end up walking away with £32,000. It's the wrong oh, answer. No. Adrian, after all this time... Oh, no. It's September in yeah. America. It's uh, September uh. in Canada. Diana was so obsessed with trying out the show herself, she made around 300 phone calls to try to get a chance. Finally landing it on April the 9th, 2001. I think of all the uh, combinations we've had, you're the first brother and sister that have come since the, uh, since the show began two and a half years ago. Though she didn't fare much better than her brother, also walking away with 32,000. You've stayed in exactly the same place as your brother. You're still on 32,000 pounds. Oh! I mean, she went away very disappointed uh, with £32,000. So I remember talking to her in the bar afterwards, and I said, great, congratulations. She said, yeah, only thirty-two. And I said to her, it's a huge amount of money. She went, yes, but I should have done more. I should have beaten my brother and all this. After months more studying and obsession, Diana's husband, Charles, now got his opportunity in the hot seat on September the 9th, 2001. He was extensively practicing for 20 minutes every day on a homemade fastest finger first machine to increase his chances of making it into the seat. They were both quite sort of, 
They seem to be quite obsessed with the show and getting on it and doing well. They both have got on it and done well. Now, we've got eight left. How many got it right? All these were correct. Most of them, nearly all of them. Uh, who was fastest? Charles Ingram in three, 3.97. That's so fast. Great. <laughs> well done, Charles. What a bit of a million pounds. <laughs> Don't you support <laughs> Catholic? <laughs> But little did we know that Charles Ingram was about to become the most infamous contestant in the history of Who Wants to Be a Millionaire. I really warmed to him, yeah. He had this terrible peer pressure in that his brother-in-law and his wife both had won £32,000. On which of these would you air laundry? Clothes dog. Clothes horse. Clothes rabbit. Clothes pig. Um, that's a clothes horse. It's the right answer, you got £100. He breezed through the first questions relatively easily, but elsewhere, Diana's other brother, Marcus Powell, had arrived at the studio, attributing extremely bizarre behaviour. Just after recording has started, um, probably about 15, 20 minutes into it, really, um, and he was outside the studio on his mobile phone, which mobile phones aren't allowed sort of in the studio area. So I went up to the production office um, where I'm full Chris Burke. Just approached him and said, excuse me, saying I can't have you in and out of the studio using the phone. Um, either if you want to make a phone call, I can get someone to escort you off site and uh, you can make as many phone calls as you wish or would you please go back in the studio, take your seat. When I went back downstairs about 10, 15 minutes later, he was back outside on his mobile again. And as soon as he saw me, he went straight back in to the studio. Uh, at which point I asked one of our security guards to, to keep an eye on him for the rest of the recording. Um, and uh, to the best of my knowledge, that's, that's exactly what he did. On just the sixth question of the full 15, Charles already began to struggle and used his first lifeline pretty early on. In Coronation Street, who is Audrey's daughter? Janice, Gail, Linda, Sally, I really haven't got a Scoobies. Now, you've got the audience. You can ask the audience. Uh, you can find a friend, or you can go 50-50. Yeah, Chris, I'd like to um, ask the audience, please. He wasn't the finest contestant we've ever had. He was struggling quite a bit, actually. My reading of him was that he was a sort of a, a mad major. You know, brave. Brave as a lion, but completely balmy. You know, probably a bit thick, but, but very, you know, uh, tim, tim but nice sort of thing. I mean, dim but nice. And he, and, I thought he was like that, and I mean, he was extraordinary to, to be opposite. I mean, he was amazing to be opposite. He was, he was fascinated. I'll, I'll follow the audience, please. I can't remember what they said. I think it was Gail. It said Gail. Yeah, yes. Gail. Okay. Right. Eighty-nine percent um, of them said Gail. And I'll run with Gail. Yeah. Even though you never heard yeah. of her. Never heard of her. Or seen her. No, afraid not. Well, Sorry, Gail, but I haven't. Okay. Uh, Fine. I'll go with Gail. Yeah. We got there. Two thousand pounds. By question seven, he was showing signs of defeat already, using his second lifeline. Gerald, hi. Um, the river Foyle is found in which part of the United Kingdom? England, Scotland, Northern Ireland or Wales? If you lose two lifelines, one lifeline left, you've struggled to that point. You know, you might be going home with 16,000, maybe 32. There's no way that you'd expect him to stay there for, for very much more than two or three questions, unless, you know, an incredibly lucky run of questions. But, you know, having sat through many hundreds of programmes, that wouldn't be what you'd expect to happen, really. He'd floundered through, but I think he had one lifeline left. And I remember us saying, God, that poor bloody major, you know, he's, he's got as much chance of getting the 32,000, you know, as going to the moon in a rocket. I mean, he, there was just no way this guy could, could possibly go much further. And I could see his wife sort of sitting up there behind him, sort of frowning at him. I thought, oh, God, and he's got his little girls and his promise and ponies and all this. Um, yeah, Northern Ireland. I'll, uh, I'll follow his, his advice. Yeah. Final answer. Final answer. It's the right answer. You've got £4,000. <laughs> Good play. OK, Charles has got... Ah! God, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, no! We come back to home. He got up to £4,000 by the end of the first night and used two lifelines. So we knew he was coming back the following evening, but expected him to last just a couple of questions or so and then be gone. Everybody expected Charles to be an early exit upon his return the next day, but he now had just a few hours to come up with a plan. Allegedly, he and his wife made a call that night to another contestant named Tequin Whittock. 
Tequin was another millionaire buff, well versed in the world of general knowledge. Well, I think he'd been on three times at least before. Um, and he was, a, he was an old millionaire hand and we were, we were new. Did he strike you as a determined contestant? He struck me as being very focused, so he wasn't in a chatty mood, I have to say. Um, yeah, perfectly polite and pleasant, but um, I think he was, he was focused on the evening in front of him. Diana would later deny knowing or even meeting Tequin Whittock, even claiming that she didn't know what he looked like. But throughout the entire show, she is seen looking at him, seemingly for help, at several points. On September the 10th, 2001, Charles Ingram returned to the studio, determined to walk away with one million pounds. Right now, he's got eight questions to go until the million. He's still got one lifeline intact. He's got that 50-50. Charles, what's the luck tonight? Let's play. Who wants to be a millionaire? He was now playing for 8,000, but despite knowing the answer himself, his new system very quickly fell into play. Who was the second husband of Jacqueline Kennedy? Adnan Khashoggi, Ronald Reagan, Aristotle Anassis, Rupert Murdoch. Right, okay. Um... Once he repeats the correct answer, a cough can be heard from the audience, seemingly to confirm his decision. I'm not certain. I would have thought, I would have thought that it would be Aristotle Anassis. <coughs> Why? Um, well, Ronald Reagan, I mean, I'm, I know who he is and I don't remember him ever being married to Jacqueline Kennedy. Aristotle Anassis ring, rings a bell or two. Um, Second husband, just for Jacqueline Kennedy. One of my sub strategies is to take my time. Oh, you've got a sub strategy. Absolutely, as well. sub sub strategy. <laughs> okay. So I'll just rethink this one for a moment. Okay. My attention was first drawn to, to, to Major Ingram um, at around the £8,000 question when our floor assistant said to me, There's something strange going on. And that was really the first time that I'd focused at what was going on on the set. I'm, I'm pretty confident it's Aristotle and Asses. Yeah, I'm going to go for Aristotle and Asses. You're a wild and crazy man, Major. <laughs> final answer? You only live once. Um, yeah, final answer. Still very happy with the strategy? Uh, no, but it's too late. So. Ah. <laughs> it's the right answer. You've got eight thousand pounds. There was something in the air that was all a bit strange, and when I did come down to the studio, the um, you know the crew, some of them were just sort of shaking their heads, going, "Something's definitely going on." By question nine, Ingram was now playing for a potential sixteen thousand pounds, but no cough is actually heard this time. Emmental is a cheese from which country? France, Italy, Netherlands, Switzerland. I mean, right, counter attack. Think counter attack. <laughs> I'm. I'd like to go for Switzerland, but I need to just think about it for a moment. Uh, and when you're up here, you know, your sort of doubts are multiplied tenfold. So, uh, so um, I think it's Switzerland. You got a 50 50 that helps. Yeah, it could be France, I suppose. Then again, it could be Italy, so. Um, or maybe it's the Netherlands. Right. <laughs> yes. Yeah. That's sort of how the question works, Charles. No, I got it. <laughs> he would make some humorous comment about each answer how it couldn't be that because he didn't know it, or it wasn't that, or he was certain it wasn't that. But he was doing that to all of them. It was very odd. It wasn't the way anybody has ever played the game or before or since in any of the territories in the experience I've had. You've never seen anything like this anywhere in the world? No, not at all. No, it's, no this was not, this is not a gambler's uh, way of playing. It wasn't somebody who knew the answer. There was no smile of recognition when an answer came up when you can see somebody knows the answer beforehand. When I sat in the hot seat, I can't remember whether I could see Because you was on it as you've actually been I've a I've actually been on the show, yeah. And how did you do? 
I won 32,000. Oh, well done. Yeah. Beautiful. That was, so that was pretty good. You knew all the answers yourself, obviously. Yeah, Charles knew the answers himself. Well, why didn't he just, he, he could have just sort of answered quickly or changed the way he was doing it? That's, that's, that's not him. I mean, Jade will find out Charles doesn't stop talking. He yeah. doesn't stop. Despite a confirmation cough in the previous question, Charles knows this correct answer again. So the room remains silent. But people did begin to notice strange behavior from Charles as he repeated every single possible option, perhaps to give an outsider the opportunity to help. Emmental, I must have eaten this a hundred times, Emmental. Um, I'm sure it's Switzerland. I'll, I'll go to Switzerland. Yeah, Switzerland. Final answer. Yeah, final answer. Why did you think it was Switzerland? Well, I just recall Emmental coming from Switzerland. I mean, I've eaten it a lot, and uh, I'm sure it had made in Switzerland or something written on it. <laughs> Swiss made. <laughs> yes. I don't know what your strategy and sub-strategy is, but it's working. You've just got sixteen thousand pounds. I think that the, uh, the the question and the options would have been transmitted via Marcus Powell's uh, open mobile phone uh, within the VIP area. I believe that the person on the other end, with access to research material, could then signal the wearer of those pages with the correct answer, A, B, C or D, depending on what part of the body the page was secreted, and then that person could either signal Charles Ingram, or indeed Charles Ingram may have been wearing the pages himself. Relatively early on, halfway through, I thought there might be something dodgy going on. Um, so what I did was I looked at his face. I assumed that it was going to be a visual clue of some sort, a visual code. So he would have a member of the audience somewhere in his eye line that would be giving him some subtle coded indication. A like, wink. like, not a wink. I mean, it's, you know, remember it's there in the light. The audience is in half light. So, you know, it would be, you know, like that for A or, or that for B or some, something fairly subtle. Um, so I, question after question, I was looking, I was locked onto his face, uh, and, but I, I couldn't detect, I couldn't detect anything that was, he was, he didn't seem to be systematically looking at the crowd. But even during the recording, even during the game, you were pretty sure that something untoward yeah. was going on. Yeah. You were that convinced? Yeah, absolutely, and said to, to Marilyn and she felt the same. The acoustics within, um, the, the, you know, the, the, what I call the bowl of the studio, are such that, you know, the sound is pretty much kept within it. And um, I was watching a monitor just on the other side. So at this point, there was absolutely no suggestion of, of, of any coughing or any noises whatsoever. This was just simply me now focused on the monitor, but kind of removed from the production of the program. I'd become so suspicious that something untoward was going on. Um, that I then said to our, our floor manager that I wanted to find out whether we could search Major Ingram when he came off the set. Despite the producers finding Charles' behaviour extremely bizarre, none of them actually noticed any frequent coughing at the time. But it was only about to get stranger. By question 10, Charles Ingram was now playing for a guaranteed £32,000. But this was the first time his behaviour really became apparent. Who had a hit UK album with Born To Do It, released in 2000? Coldplay, Top Loader, A1, Craig David. I'm afraid. Um, born to do it. I vaguely recall it. I'm, I'm sure I've heard of the title. But I, I don't honestly know for sure. Um, Take your time, have a look at it. Um, you can obviously walk away with 16,000 because you would lose 15 if you gave me a wrong answer. Yeah. I think, I think, I think it's A1. You got a 50-50. Craig David, I just can't, I don't think, I've, I've never heard of Craig David, to be honest. It's quite well <laughs> Is that simple? Um, Coldplay I've never heard of. And Top Loader is a, well, it's part of a rifle, so I don't think it's that. <laughs> uh, it's also a Brazier. Is it? All right, well, thank you for that. <laughs> I wouldn't know, you know. Um, 
So I think I'll, um, sadly, I'll have to take 50-50 here. Sadly, that's what they're for. It is. Right. Computer, take away two wrong answers. Leave Charles the right answer and one other wrong answer. I had to help you at all, actually, but, yeah. <laughs> um, the two answers left were Craig David, who he admitted to have never heard of, and A1, who he had been gunning for all along. And when those two answers were left, he said, well, that doesn't give me any help, which, hang on a second, you've been saying A1 all along, so, and you, you didn't know Craig David, so why haven't you now gone, oh, it must be A1 then? Um, so, no, the man was playing a different game to anything I've ever seen. It's up to you. I can't help you, Charles. It's your lifeline gone, but... <laughs> It's worth £32,000, a big old drop if you get it wrong. My boss, Adrian Wolfe, came running across the studio, which in itself was a sight, and um, he said, we have a problem. And uh, I didn't know what quite he meant, but having then been told that he believed there was something funny going on with the contestant in the hot seat, um, we then concentrated on that. And I was by a monitor, so I was able to see the way the man was playing the game, and also I was able to stand behind the cameras looking directly at him, and see for myself that it was unusual, if not completely strange, uh, the way he was attempting to answer the questions and the way he finally chose an answer. It was well out of any understanding or experience I'd ever had. Craig David. I can't, I can't influence your judgment at all. You're only getting the chair once. Risking 15,000, I really am. A1, A1 or Craig David. I'm gonna go for A1. Yep. Final answer. <laughs> Are we on the Sorry. main strategy or the sub strategy? Oh, I've rather lost the plot here of your, yeah. of your well, campaign. It's like, it's like detour at the moment. Yeah. Okay. It's a lot of money to lose. You don't have to play it. You can take 16,000. I mean, I'm 80% of the time I'm wrong when I guess, so. No, I'll go Craig David. <laughs> yeah. Final answer. I'm going to guess Craig David. Final answer. Final answer. We'll take a break. Join us again no, in a couple of minutes no. for the second part of tonight. Who wants to be a millionaire? Don't go away. Mrs Ingram developed quite a nasty cough on that particular question. Um, the Major seemed to be struggling to answer it. Um, and there was enough concern for production to decide that they needed to, to stop the recording, um, to rewind the tape, to look back at it. Why did you cough then, Diana? I, I think I needed to clear my throat. So even at that stage, Third question in, mm -hmm. on the night, mm -hmm. the recording is stopped because there's concerned suspicion? Yes, yes, there was some cause for concern. Several coughs can be heard during this question as Charles nearly gets the incorrect answer. And some can even be seen coming from Diana herself, who was even caught looking at the monitor, possibly to check if she was on the cameras or not, without realizing that her every move was still being recorded. Why were you looking at the monitors? Why was I looking at the monitors? Mm. Well, because that's the only way you can see Charles's face. He reckons most of his guesses are 80% wrong. He changed his mind, knowing he'd lose £15,000 if he gave him the wrong answer, and went for Craig David, who he'd never heard of. <laughs> he just won £32,000. <laughs> It was at this point when the staff inside the studio were fairly convinced that there was some form of cheating going on, but they couldn't quite put their finger on how it was done. Gentlemen versus players was an annual match between amateurs and professionals of which sport? Lawn tennis, rugby union, polo, cricket. Charles Ingram was now playing for big money, number 11 of 15 for a possible £64,000. But like before, he knows the correct answer, but his decision is followed possibly by another confirmation cough. I mean, it could be any of them, really. 
but I think it's cricket, uh, but I'm not sure. And, but the reason I think it's cricket is because I'm sure I've seen a print, a picture, a print on, on either cigarette cards or, or, or um, you know, the old cigarette cards you used to get, or, or, um, or my, I don't know, grandfather's study wall or something, you know, it's gentlemen versus players. But I'm not sure. And that was a cricket, they were, they were playing cricket? I think so. Lawn tennis, rugby union, polo, cricket. I think it might be cricket. Uh, it's worth 64,000. You might as well play yeah, it. Indeed. Um, Take your time, have a good look. It could be lawn tennis. It might have been lawn tennis. Maybe it was polo. I'm <laughs> doing this again, sorry. I don't think it would have been polo. Gentlemen versus players. Annual match between amateurs and professionals. Which sport? Lawn tennis? I think, I think it's, it's least likely to be rugby union, I would have thought. Rugby union, polo or cricket? I don't think it's rugby union. I don't think it's lawn tennis. I just don't recall any connection, but I've heard of it definitely, and but I don't have any connection with polo. So I'm, I think if I had to guess, and I can, I you think can I'd it. take cricket. <laughs> oh God! <laughs> <coughs> no, it's, it's not fair on everyone else. I'll, I'll go for cricket. It doesn't matter about everybody else. They'll play anyway. Don't worry. Um, You'll play. Final cricket. Answer. Cricket. Final answer. You got £32,000, your wife came and she won £32,000. You just won £64,000! When you hear the coughs which are adjacent to the right answers, when you first hear them, you're looking to see if the pattern stays, you know, if it's a pattern that's going to be repeated and sustained throughout the series of, the series of questions. But after a while, when it is, your reaction on hearing it is one of humour. I mean, you start to laugh, really, when the coughs come up right on cue, you think, gosh, there it is again. During all of this, other contestants around the stage had noticed that a decent amount of coughing was coming from none other than Tequan Wittek. What they found especially odd was that he hadn't had this cough previously, and he would always seemingly turn to cough towards the stage, though he would later defend this act by claiming that he didn't want to cough directly in other contestants' faces. After for about five, ten minutes, he seems to be coughing all the time. It's just strange because he didn't cough before the show in rehearsals and he didn't cough after the show when he was in the chair. Other witnesses didn't notice any coughing, nor did the host Chris Tarrant himself, but some believed that he was cheating and possibly using someone in the studio to provide him with visual clues. I had no idea of anything going on at all. To be honest, once it gets up to the big money, I've got like a very, very concentrated job to do. So really, short of somebody, you know, sending up smoke signals or lighting a bonfire in the audience. I mean, I would not pick anything up normally. Um, just in, I mean, I'm this close to someone, I'm eyeball to eyeball. So no, I'm not aware of anything at all. And, and I was genuinely amazed when I came off here that there was, um, you know, murmurings and suspicion that something might have, might, have, might have happened that night that was illegal. You know this, there was so much, especially a guy's winning a million pounds. Yeah. Of, there was a huge, you know, people roaring, screaming. People cough like mad. Everybody's coughing in the studio because they're sort of enclosed or whatever. I had no idea. The Ambassadors in the National Gallery is a painting by which artist? Van Eyck. Holbein. Michelangelo. Rembrandt. By question 12, playing for £125,000. Ingram again knew the answer, which is confirmed by another cough. I think it was either Holbein or Rembrandt. I have seen it. Um, I, think, I think it was Holbein. <laughs> yeah, I'm, sh I'm sure it was Holbein. But it was at this stage that Diana began to appear to look nervous. 
It's been theorized that they actually concocted this scheme to reach a certain point, but Charles had gone against their agreed plan and took it further than they had intended. I don't think it was Michael Michelangelo. I don't think it was Van Eyck. In fact, I, I'm not sure that I've actually ever heard of Van Eyck. Um, I don't Just think remind it... you hadn't heard of Craig David. Oh, I know. <laughs> <laughs> somehow that's how you got it. I don't think it was Rembrandt. I'm pretty sure it was Holbein. Are you sure enough to risk £32,000 on it? Yeah. I think so. It's your call. It's a lot of money. You've got 64000 you've got no lifelines, you can walk away with that sum of money. Uh, down payment on a house. Yeah, I think I'm going to go for Holbein. <coughs> yeah, um, Holbein. Final answer. I can't see any clues in your face. <laughs> Holbein, yeah. yeah. Holbein. You just won 125,000. <laughs> I think if they bailed out 125,000, I don't think any of us would be sat here. I think it's just pushed that a little bit too far. And as I said, every step of the way up, there's more evidence that you've got to argue away one way or another. And it may well be easy to argue away three questions with a cough. But, you know, when you're talking about 17, 18 persistent coughs at specific points, that appear to be leading somebody, I think you back yourself into a corner. If you give me a wrong answer to this question, if you decide to play it, you don't have to, you've got no lifelines, you would lose £93,000. It's a thing I do a lot, I sort of repeat it as, 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 as the money goes up and up and up. And with the Major, I constantly seem to be bringing him back to earth. And you'd see him go, yes, right, yes, thanks for that. Anyway, ignore all that and carry on. If you do the £500,000 question, you're playing for a million, I say to you, Eamon Holmes, you've got £500,000. If you go for it, next one and get it right, right, you win a million. But if you get it wrong, you lose £450,000. Yeah. Now, everybody has said that to over Just 16 say, years. You see I'll their bank face. The money. Oh. Bank the money. Except, and I only thought about this months later, the Major who went, yes, OK, let's play, because he knew he was going to play and he knew he was going to get it right and he knew he was going to win a million pounds. I think it was when it was getting on for sort of serious money, probably when we sort of got to one, two, five. I think that's probably when, you know, I mean, I definitely thought something very strange was going on. You're seeing something happen in front of you. You think that there might be collusion going on. You think there might be cheating going on. You're not 100% sure. It's difficult. It certainly is not my call to stop the programme. It had been stopped once already. I was alerted by the sound supervisor, Kevin Duff, and by our director to listen out because on the microphones they could hear some coughing going on. And obviously in the studio, there's always spluttering and bits of coughing going on, but this seemed uh, more systematic, so I listened out. And uh, I was directed to look in the audience, but I soon realised that it was actually coming from another contestant. By question 13, £250,000 was on the line. What type of garment is an Anthony Eden? Overcoat, hat, shoe, tie. But on this occasion, Tequan Wittuk didn't actually know the answer, but his microphone was still recording, and he could be picked up asking the contestant next to him for the correct answer, before turning and coughing towards the stage. Again, you know, I'm, I'm not sure, but I, I think it's a hat. I think it's one of those really sort of tall hats that sort of came into fashion, presumably when he was Prime Minister. <coughs> well, this is the famous hat question, of course. What type of garment is an Anthony Eden? And here we've got Chris Tarrant going through the various possibilities. An overcoat, a shoe, a hat, of course, which is the right answer, or a tie. And what we hear at the same time as this is conversation among the FFF contestants where one man with a Cockney accent, Mr Lucy, Thomas Lucy, in fact confirms that it is a hat. Just after he confirms it's a hat, you hear Ingram say to Tarrant, 
I think it's a hat, and of course, Whittock's there right on cue. <coughs> a question had been asked, and the answer had been given, and as I turned around to look towards my son, uh, Tequin Whittock said to me, did you know that answer? And I said, yes, I did. Why do you think he asked you that question? I, I, I don't know. I think it was probably just because I turned around and I was sort of looking his way just for something to say. I'm sure it's a hat. Am I sure? <laughs> <coughs> yeah, hat. It's a hat. You lose £93,000 if you're wrong, Charles. No, going for a hat. Final answer. Yep, final answer. You just won £255! It's easy for me to realise that it was Tequin doing the coughing because he was only about 10 or 15 feet away from me, directly in front of me. And the way he was coughing was rather bizarre. Um, he was actually turning towards the set to cough. So at one point he was chatting to the contestant to his left in a whispered way, and then he would turn round a full 90 degrees with his head, cough towards the hot seat, and then turn away again. By the penultimate question, for £500,000, Charles Ingram is convinced that he knows the correct answer. But he's wrong. Baron Houseman is best known for his planning of which city? Rome, Paris, Berlin, Athens. I think it's Berlin. I think. <laughs> Charles, ten minutes ago you thought it was A1. <laughs> I think, I think it's Berlin. Take your time. It's worth half a million. It's a huge amount of money to win. It's also a huge amount of money to drop. And Hausmann's a, it's more a German name than an Italian name. And... He was convinced that it was Berlin, you know, prompted by the fact that he believed that Baron Hausmann was a, a German name. Um, and kept focusing on Berlin. I mean, he went on and on and on about Berlin. And um, then he says something to the effect of, but it could be Paris, and then gets a cough. Take as long as you need. I think it's Berlin. <gasps> and he's going for Berlin, you can hear he's going for Berlin. And then all of a sudden, you hear a cough, which is now acknowledged to be from Wittig, which is, <coughs> no, <coughs> no. And the no is partly in whisper, but it's a loud no like that. When I say partly in whisper, it's not no, it's no. And it comes right on the heels of the cough. <coughs> no. So in a way, what, what, what the cough is doing there, what Mr. Wittig's doing there, is breaking the code, the agreed code. But he can only do that by putting a no there with his cough. Otherwise, Ingram would interpret the cough as meaning Berlin is the right answer. It suddenly occurs to me that this, this bloke's being helped out here. And as soon as I have that thought, almost as soon, it's the bloke who's coughing. You know, this is what's going on in, on in my mind. It wasn't a long process, it was almost immediate. It's the bloke who's coughing. He's, you know, is he sending him signals? So I've immediately alighted on Te Tekun Wittig. To make matters worse, he breaks the system of repeating every single possible option. I've got to rethink it. I don't think it's Paris. I don't <coughs> think... I don't think it's Athens. I'm sure it's not Rome. I'd have thought it's Berlin, but there's a chance it's Paris. I'm not sure. I've got to think. I read this. I think it's Berlin. This was also followed by Tequin Wittuk violently blowing his nose, which some have theorized could have also been another code in their system. It could be Paris. <laughs> You've done it to play this question. You've got a check for a quarter of a million. I know it's tempting, you've done it to play it. If you give me the right answer, it's worth £500,000. And you stand to lose 218000 I think it is Paris. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to play. 
he just he freezes for the moment he obviously completely regains his thoughts because I think that he is relatively convinced himself uh, that it is um, the answer is Berlin there's a cough there's a no and then just after that there's a, a little series of nose blowing as well the nose blowing only ever happened at that point um, and it's only my subjective opinion but I think if you've got a system you've got to have a an all-stop signal because Otherwise, you could end up in a, in a very difficult position. And I think that was probably part of their all-stop signal. The all-stop was the nose blowing? I think so. And, of course, the, the word no. Well, that helps. Lo and behold, he does come right round the houses, goes for the answer that he originally discarded. And uh, Tequan Wittek did cough in the right place. It's either Berlin or Paris. And I think it's Paris. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to play. I'm going to play. I'm going to play Paris. You were convinced it was Berlin. I know. I know. I, I think I was wrong. I'm going to go for Paris. Final answer. Final answer. You had £250,000. You did not need to play this question. You thought it was Berlin, Berlin, Berlin. You change your mind to Paris. That brought you 500,000. Yes! Yes! Normally, I probably would be quite excited that, you know, one of my contestants has won a lot of money. Um, but because I, I had some doubt in my mind that something strange was going on, I don't think I could really sort of get enthusiastic about it, really. Charles Ingram was now on the final question for £1 million, with all eyes inside the studio now focused on Tequan Wittock. But Diana clearly didn't want him to continue. A number one followed by 100 zeros is known by what name? Google. Megatron. Gigabit. Nano mole. It's worth a million. I'm entirely focused on Tequan Wittig. Um, he's sitting over there. In he's the sitting third. over there at seat three. I know what the, the answer to the question is before the four answers come up, so I can really study the process between these two people. He was about to answer the million-pound question which means that he stands to win a million pounds, but he also stands to lose, if he's wrong, 468,000 pounds, a tidy sum to anybody. And it became obvious that he wasn't under the pressure that he should have been somehow. It didn't make sense. He should have been very, very careful and very certain. And he certainly wasn't both of those, or either of those, I should say. Right then. Let's see. Um, mega Nano. I'm not sure. However, <laughs> Charles, you haven't been sure since question number, <laughs> question number two. Well, as I said, sort of, I don't know, it feels like ages ago now. You know. It is. The doubt is sort of multiplied. I miss quite a lot of um, the, the action um, of the, the, the questions between the 64 and uh, I think about the quarter of a million pound question because the, the frantic phone calls were going on. Um, but the fact that he was still there without actually knowing what was going on um, confirmed my suspicions. And, and certainly when watching the million pound question, you know, my heart was pumping. I came into the studio and I saw Adrian and he asked me if I thought that there was anything suspicious going on. Um, and I had been uneasy up until that point and, and we basically discussed whether there was any possibility of cheating, whether he could have got hold of the questions beforehand or whether his wife or he had any kind of device on them or if indeed he was being helped by anyone else in the audience. I'm waiting for Tequan Wittig to cough at precisely the moment that the Major mentions the word Google. You've got £500,000 in your hand. Nobody at all would blame you to walk away with that amount of money. It's a huge check. If you give me a wrong answer, you lose £468,000. 
Once again, Whitaker can be heard checking for the answer with nearby contestants before coughing towards the set and now being caught in the act. I'm also thinking during that process, <laughs> which is almost completely the opposite of that, I'm thinking, don't you, don't you dare, don't you dare, I'll have you. I'm thinking that at the same time as I'm thinking, I want you to to cough because I want I want this I want I want to, to know that I'm right in what I've been in my suspicions. Once again Ingram listed off every possible answer and then completely changed his mind. I think it's a nanomole. But it could be a gigabit. Sure, I can go. I just don't think I can do this one. God, I don't think it's a Megatron. And I have to say, I haven't. I don't think I've heard of a Google. Google. The first time he mentions the word Google, cough, cough, gotcha. Google. By process of elimination, I actually think it's Google, but I don't know what a Google is. So. That's sort of how we got to Craig David. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> he went for it because you'd never ever heard of him. I don't think it's Gigabit, and I don't think it's Nanomole. And I don't think it's Megatron. I really do think it's a Google. <laughs> You thought it was a nanomole. <laughs> and you've never heard of a Google. And there's a million pounds involved. I know, but it's not a gigabit nanomole and megatron, and there's only four of them, so it must be Google. Um, mustn't it? No. <laughs> I don't actually know what a Google is, but. <laughs> I mean, it's the only chance I'll ever have of winning a million, but it's a hell of a chance. Charles, downside. it's also the only chance you'll ever have of losing 468,000 pounds. <laughs> But let's put that into the equation. Yeah, you've got I'm... half a million. You're going for the one you've never heard of. Just because you haven't heard of it. I can't influence you, it's entirely your call, but you've got £500,000. I mean, I don't mind taking the odd risk now and again. <laughs> <laughs> that was a joke, by the way. It hasn't been a joke. You've been like it for an hour. <laughs> you've been like it for two days. OK, let's... Um, Take your time. Take as long as you need. You've got £500,000. I mean, my strategy has worked so far. You know, just take it by the bit and go for it. Um, I was defensive on the, on, on the last show, and, and that, you know, very slowly got me somewhere, but, you know, minus a lot of lifelines. And I've been very positive, I think. Have I? I don't know. Very, maybe not. Very positive. Maybe not. Positive ever since. Um, if okay. you're wrong, you lose £468,000. I don't think it's a gigabit. I don't think it's an animal. Megatron, mega, 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 yeah. I don't think it's Megatron. The staff didn't believe that Ingram was acting like someone who was now risking half a million pounds. But despite his wife's wishes, Charles waits for one final confirmation before going for the jackpot. I'm sure it's Google. <laughs> Chris, I'm going to play. No, I'm not. <laughs> yes, I am. Oh, yeah. I'm going to play. I am going to play. Yeah. You do not have to play this question. There's nothing on my screen here. You do not have to play this. You've got £500,000. I wish I could turn around and see. I would. No, I'm not going to. Charles, do not look round. Trust me, I won't. do Don't not worry. look round. Don't worry. I'm sure You've the got £500,000. You yeah. lose £468,000 if you're wrong. I've got no answer on my screen. I'm just making you aware of exactly how you are. No one's ever lost £468,000 before. No, it's a, it's a Google. Tell me it's a money. It's a Google. God, is it a Google? Yeah. Yeah, it's a Google. Yeah. Yeah. I think I know. It's, uh, I think it's a Google. <laughs> I'm going to play Google. Yeah. Final, Final answer. answer. Final answer. 
Please don't go for a break. Please do not go for a break. <laughs> Please don't. <laughs> You're going to go for a break. <laughs> I'm going for a break. Oh, God. Oh, God. <laughs> this is turning into an epic night. Nobody's ever lost 468,000. No discussions, please, ladies and gentlemen. It's I'm not sure fair. It's, I really am sure. it's a serious amount of money at stake. Uh, yeah, just a bit. <laughs> okay, coming on. They said that they were on the commercial break and they were about to go back and say that the guy had won a million. But they were certain that there was some form of cheating going on. What should they do? I called Paul and I said to him that I felt very strongly that he ought to come up to the studio that night. He initially was very dismissive. Um, and I said, well, what evidence do you have? And they said, well, just gut instinct. And I said, well, we, we can't stop a show and accuse someone on gut instinct. I said, you must go ahead and we will deal with it later. Major Charles Ingram came on tonight with just £4,000. He only had one lifeline left. He got up to £500,000. He got this question. A number one followed by 100 zeros is known by what name? Google, Megatron. Gigabit, Nanomole. He initially went for Nanomole. He then went through his various options again. He knew he would lose £468,000 if he was wrong. He then went for Google mainly because he'd never heard of it and he'd heard of the other three. Charles, give me that check. £500,000. <laughs> you no longer have that. You just won one million! <laughs> However, not every contestant can be seen celebrating, as the suspicion was certainly well-founded. Well, I'm just sitting there, uh, glaring at uh, Tequan Wittig, probably glaring at the Major as well. And uh, my reaction is I can't believe that it, I seem to be the only person who's witnessed what I've seen. You know, I, am I the only one here who's seen this? Did I really see this? You know, what's going on here? Why has nobody else noticed what's happening here? When the programme finished, I walked from here and I met my son coming down the stairs over there. And as he looked at me, he said he was at it, Dad. And I said, do you think so? He said, definite. When the Major won his million pounds, it was quite a strange atmosphere in here because building up to that, there'd been a feeling of disbelief amongst the crew anyway. Because we strongly suspected he was cheating. And then when he got to the million pounds, the atmosphere wasn't how it should be at all. And I noticed that certain members of the crew, not all of them, but some of them weren't sure how to react because they were obviously had suspicions of their own. Um, I noticed some of them were slow clapping and just looking at me, not really sure how to, what to do. And I just basically said, come on, you know, we've got to, we've got to maintain that this is a genuine win until we know otherwise. I was there when Julie's Keppel won, won her million. Um, and the whole production team, everybody was elated. It was a, a fantastic moment, um, especially having been with the show since the start. You know, you really want somebody to get there and you really want somebody to say that, that little step and do it. Um, but because of the way, that, uh, the way that it appeared the Major had got to this point, as I say, everybody was just incredibly uncomfortable. I was down just sort of offset, where um, they sort of came off and hugged each other and Diana was crying. But, I mean, I didn't totally believe that it was real tears. It sort of, to me, was a bit put on and seemed sort of a bit fake. Wow! <laughs> yes! God, I can't believe it! <laughs> Literally, they'd walk down the steps from um, the edge of the set and the way that it was put to them um, after congratulating them was that it was common practice with big winners. Um, that we search them for security reasons and would they object to having such a search done. I searched his clothing, I searched his hair, I even asked him to take his shoes off um, and I found nothing. And the feeling that I was left with at that time was incredibly disappointed um, because my suspicions hadn't, um, hadn't uh, gone away. Um, I was just left feeling, well, um, I don't quite understand what's gone on here. But what the staff found particularly strange was the behaviour of the couple after supposedly winning £1 million. They could be heard loudly arguing in their dressing room, and they didn't even call their children to inform them of their victory. Security guards sort of pointed out that the sort of shouting coming from the, their dressing room, um, and their window was open, so, you know, as soon as they, he said that, we all sort of listened, and of course, you know, 
there was raised voices coming from there. Um, and as the security guard sort of went a bit nearer to the window to see if he could hear what was being said, the window was slammed shut. There was an atmosphere between the two of them in the dressing room when I was there, an atmosphere dominated by her, and the impression was that something was not as it should be, definitely. Diana looked very sort of shaken and, I mean, just looked physically sort of just not very happy. Um, and Charles was very tense. Um, and at that point he had a cigar, so he was, a lot of his attention was sort of looking down on the floor, playing with the ash in the ashtray, and just generally not saying very much at all. These two people had just won a million pounds. They should have been ecstatically happy. They should have wanted to speak to the children. They should have wanted to speak to the dog. They should have wanted to do something other than be as miserable as they seemed. Um, and the atmosphere, in hindsight, in, and this is speculation, is that he had gone further than they had agreed that he would go. And as a result, he had possibly exposed himself to what has now happened, the trial and the subsequent decision of the jury. While their argument intensified backstage, Tequan Whittock was actually next in the hot seat, and his cough now suddenly disappeared. This is Tequan Whittock. He's from Whitchurch near Cardiff. He's head of business studies at Pontypris College of Further Education, which is a nice short job title. Up there in the audience, hoping Dad's going to win a million, his youngest son, Reese, and uh, watching at home, our wife, Jill, and three more kids, Robert, Helen, and another Jill, along with their ancient old Labrador, Bouncer. If Tequin does well tonight, uh, wife Jill, not daughter Jill, you have to pay attention, wants a conservatory, and Reese, who's up there, who's a huge fan of Only Fools and Horses, has been promised a new car, but it has to be a Robin Reliance. <laughs> you are a plonker, Reese. Twelve-year-old Bouncer, the dog, also stands to get his very own luxury silk-lined bed. So you've got it all plotted out then, Tech, haven't you? It's all well planned, Chris, yes. OK, lots of luck. Here we go. Uh, three lifelines. Sadly, he was unable to follow in Ingram's footsteps and walked away with only £1,000. Tech, when you just lost £3,000. <sighs> the show then went off the air as the producers frantically tried to search for any clues of foul play. I got into my car and went up to the studio centre. I said to them to keep the, 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 the gallery, the, the truck, powered up. Uh, could they put all the tapes up for me and I would have a look at them. We sat together and watched through the programmes. Um, and to Paul's credit, I have to say, he did try and play devil's advocate with me. Um, he tried to re as best he could to refute each one of the coughs when I said, well, there, Paul, that one, there, that one. He would, you know, do his best. Um, as we got further up the money tree, um, he got quieter and quieter until we got to the, the million pound question when he was silent and quite pale. After checking over the tapes, they concluded that there was in fact some cheating taking place, involving the coughing from Tequan Whittock. At this point, the money was withheld and the case was handed over to the police to investigate. I have to tell you that, that we have suspicions from viewing the recording of last Monday's uh, programme and subsequently studying the tapes carefully, that there were irregularities during the taping of the show in which you participated. Oh, good Lord, no. Because of that, I have to tell you that these suspicions have been referred to the police. Right. And thus, we, for not for the moment, will be airing the programme or indeed authorising payment of the cheque. Right. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, I completely refute that, obviously. Um, good Lord, I must say, go All right, well, thanks for letting me know. Okay, thank you. Mm. Cheers, bye. What effectively I was saying was, you have cheated us of a million pounds on our show. And... I would have suspected that I would have, if I'd have been him in that situation, I would have said, hang on a minute, hang on a minute, hang on a minute, you know, what are you talking about? I did not cheat, if I can use that very firm expression to cover everything. I can't say that there wasn't coughing going on, but I did not um, either hear or use coughing as any form of mechanism for being able to answer those questions. Did not cheat. <laughs> and he didn't. <laughs> Well, he just didn't. Very I watched nice the program, is it, guys? And I have to say, Charles, I did think he was a bit iffy. Well, I'd be lying like... <laughs> if, I said, if, if I said no, and I don't like lies. Yeah. I don't know. Well, I, um, I watched it as well, and, you know, then, I, I, had, that, I had then... the same opinion. Well, I should make one thing clear, and I'll only say it once, and that's it, and then I'll move on and talk about the victim side of it. Um, we didn't cheat on that show. There was no plan to cheat on that show. 
I won that money perfectly honestly and fairly and squarely. And while I was sitting there in the centre of the studio, I did not notice any coughing at all. I was entirely unaware of it. As for the victims, I've heard a lot of people say that this is a, a victimless crime. Well, actually, there are victims. The three defendants were the victims. We should not have been found guilty on the evidence that was presented in court. We were found guilty on a very good story. Pieces of the jigsaw crammed together that, weren't, that were ill-fitting, and indeed pieces were missing, and they were wallpapered over. On April the 7th, 2003, Charles and Diana Ingram, as well as Tequan Whittock, were all convicted of procuring the execution of a valuable security by deception and were all given prison sentences, suspended for two years. The Ingrams for 18 months and Whittock for 12. All of them were fined £15,000 and ordered to pay a further £10,000 towards prosecution costs. Charles and Diana were ordered to also pay additional defence costs, totalling a repayment payment balance of £115,000. Charles Ingram has always maintained his innocence and claimed that the tapes played for the jury were unfairly manipulated and unrepresentative of what he had actually heard that day. People watch it and they think, well, you know, that's the show, you know, that's what it was like. But it's not the case. The people either side of him said that they didn't notice any coughing. That tape is nothing to do with me. It is, you know, it was said in court that it did not represent what I would have heard. It is a perverse verdict in light of the evidence. The audio and video had the sounds amplified for the sake of the prosecution, but Ingram maintained that he didn't listen for, encourage or notice any coughing coming from anywhere. There were 192 coughs recorded, 32 were from the fastest finger first contestants, and 19 of which were significant and came from Tequan Whittock whenever a correct answer was spoken. On August the 18th that year, Ingram was ordered by the army board to resign his commission and give up his rank of major, but it's unknown if he was dishonourably discharged or not, though they did advise that it wouldn't affect his pension entitlements. On October the 28th, 2003, Charles and Diana Ingram were found guilty of further charges of obtaining pecuniary advantage by deception after they attempted to claim on an insurance policy from an alleged burglary in their home. It turned out that Charles had failed to inform Direct Line Insurance about the claims he had made in the three years before he took out the policy. However, the spokesman for Wiltshire Constabulary David Taylor believed that this wasn't actually fraud, but the court claimed that Ingram had been a habitual claimant from Norwich Union after suffering unfortunate losses of private possessions. It was alleged that he had switched insurers to Zurich in 1997 when Norwich reduced their burglary claim, but then a few years later he switched back again to direct line when it became cheaper. Ingram attempted to gain a community service charge, fearing that other criminals would bully him inside prison. But this was denied. Charles was given a conditional discharge of £30,000 due to fraudulent crimes. The entire ordeal didn't dishearten the Ingrams, however, as in November that year, Charles appeared on Channel 5's 19 Keys where he only just lost out to Paul Daniels. And the experience didn't dent their confidence, as he and Diana would both later appear on Channel 4's The Games, BBC's The Weakest Link and Channel 4's Wife Swap. Diana and Charles, in classical music, what C is the act of throat clearing that members of concert audiences are traditionally asked to try to avoid? Cough! <laughs> yeah. On May the 19th, 2004, Ingram's appeal was denied, but the court did agree to reduce his wife's fine and prosecution costs. On October the 5th, the House of Lords denied Charles leave to appeal against his own costs, but he did continue to appeal to the European Court of Human Rights. By October the 20th, the judge eventually reduced Charles' defence costs down to £25,000 and Diana's to £5,000, though his would later be reduced again to £5,000 as well. Why not just admit it? Mm. We didn't do it. We really didn't cheat. I certainly did not cheat. In the middle of that room, I heard no coughing whatsoever. Between 2006 and 2007, Charles Ingram would release two novels, and in 2010, he would end up actually losing three toes on his left foot in a horrific accident with a lawnmower. Charles, you describe yourself as an author. Yeah. Do you make up stories? This is going. I mean, perhaps a story about a dashing young major with a throat infection. 
There are those who think I cheat game shows for a living, and it's very tempting, I have to say. Is life tough for you, Lady Macbeth? <laughs> but despite his best efforts, Charles Ingram could never quite escape his infamy as a contestant on Who Wants to Be a Millionaire. But in 2006, journalist John Ronson came out to speculate that they may actually be innocent. Ronson had attended every single day of the trial, and he noticed that any time the word cough was mentioned, several pensioners in the public gallery let out a cough of their own. Chess Grandmaster James Plaskett, who had also appeared in the Fastest Finger First round several times in the past, and even made it onto the show to win £250,000, argued that this could have actually been an innocent example of coughs being caused by unconscious triggers. He theorised that Whittock or other contestants or audience members may have involuntarily coughed when they heard the correct answer. And it subconsciously also triggered Charles to go for that choice for that question upon hearing the cough. However, this calls into question Tequan whispering the word no, because James Plaskett had previously sat in the exact same seat as Tequan Whittock, and he claimed that someone may have audibly said no in response to an incorrect option, the same way that other waiting contestants may have done the same thing without realising. I just hope they don't make a big deal about the Major might be innocent. I have sat through so many hours with the police and the fraud squad of tapes of the Major show. He is so guilty. It's like once you lock into it, it's like, oh, for God's yeah. sake. The whole millionaire case is very, very difficult to live with. But Jade has um, gone to considerable lengths to make me sort of see the light, um, basically making a joke out of things. Tequan claimed to have suffered a persistent cough for most of his life, and he maintained that it was a genuine combination of hay fever and dust allergy within the studio, claiming that it was just a coincidence that the cough seemed to always coincide with the correct answers. However, people have called this into question, as his cough disappeared once he appeared on the show himself. Whittock claimed that he drank several glasses of water to try to get through the show, but this was heavily disputed. He even denied knowing the answer to three of the questions that he supposedly helped out with. However, this was proven to have been false, as the police investigated his home and found the answer to one of the questions inside a handwritten general knowledge book. But Tequin pointed out that he actually had a long string of bad luck with quiz shows, as he proved with his £1,000 win that day. He had previously been eliminated in the first round of Channel 4's 15 to 1. He lost at ITV's The People vs. and Sale of the Century. He didn't do well at Beat the Bong, though he did manage to reach the semi-finals of the BBC radio quiz show Brain of Britain. But he cites this as evidence that he would have been the worst person to try to help someone cheat to win a million pounds. So I suppose when it comes to Whittock's involvement and Charles and Diana's victory on Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, we'll have no choice but to speculate and keep seeking answers.